Alisa Vidi, I am so excited to have you on the podcast. Um, I was just telling you that Woman Code, your book, has really changed my life and it's changed the way that I look at uh, women health, you know, like the female body and hormones. And I guess I just want to jump in with one of my biggest questions before we get into anything. It's the whole medical industry is so male skewed. I didn't realize that till I read Woman Code. Yeah, it's, it's not that it's, I wouldn't go, uh, let's rephrase it to say that there is an, un, an inordinate amount of gender bias that's institutionalized in the medical community. They're aware of it, in fact, and I wrote about in the new book, In the Flow, that, you know, the medical community is really concerned about the lack of women being included in human clinical trials because they know that without that specific research they're making these enormous assumptions that you know women are just smaller versions of men which is completely not the case but they're basing a lot of your care on that assumption and that's not just the medical industry that that gender bias is not just there it's also in nutrition and fitness research as well women's bodies and our physiology fundamentally is not being included in research. And then it's therefore not being adequately represented or included in the, the information that you're consuming when it comes to your health and wellness, right? You're thinking, this is why, again, there, there, there's sort of these two big aha moments that led me to write this new book, In the Flow. Um, the first was this whole, you know, women are being left out of medical fitness and nutrition research. But the second being that we are using things like intermittent fasting, high intensity interval training, whatever diets you've ever tried that has been reported to give some sort of benefit. All of that research was done pre predominantly on men and definitely optimizes their biology and their hormones, right? And we see that in the statistics. 50% of women are struggling with hormone issues. That is nowhere on the same galaxy as, like it's less than 10% for men, right? So something is so fundamentally flawed and what it is is that our fundamental biological rhythm is being left out of all of this research. And so everything that you've ever tried that is working for men is not working for you and worse, it's disrupting this fundamental biological rhythm. And I would say the worst of the worst is that we don't even know its name. Mm -hmm. And the name of this rhythm is the infradian rhythm. And you've got to get to know it because it affects six key systems of your body. It is governing everything about how your the quality of your health and your life. And you know, if the biohacking community has made famous this idea of the circadian rhythm, right? Like wear your blue light blocking glasses so you don't mess up your circadian rhythm, that kind of a thing. Um, we as women have, again, we're being left out of that conversation too, because women from the first period to their last have a second biological rhythm called the infradian rhythm. And In the Flow is the first book to, to break ground on this subject um, ever and to talk about this infradian rhythm and what it means for you. Wow. Okay. So then I guess since this is so important, we got to just get into that. So can you explain to my listeners who may not be familiar, what is our infradian rhythm and how does it affect our lives? Yes, ma'am, I will. So the infradian <laughs> rhythm is this uh, biological clock, just like the circadian rhythm you experience in the course of 24 hours, the infradian rhythm you experience in the course of a monthly cycle, but it goes way beyond your period, right? So just like the circadian rhythm affects your sleep-wake cycle, it goes way beyond that. For example, the circadian rhythm um, regulates when your body temperature is highest, when it's lowest, when your blood pressure is highest, when it's lowest, when your bowel movements are more active, when they're least active, right? The, the circadian rhythm is a lot more than just being about your sleep-wake cycle. And exactly the same way, the infradian rhythm is a lot more than just being about your cycle, your period. It affects your brain chemistry, your metabolism, your microbiome, your stress response system, your immune response system, and your reproductive system, menstruation, fertility, and sex drive. So if you're somebody who has been trying all sorts of things to get healthy, to hack your wellness, to do whatever, and you, um, you know, don't feel the way that you're being told you should be feeling based on the 
information that's being put out into the to the media. The reason is because the 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 trends in our wellness culture are based on research that's done on men, and then you're applying it to your system that is infradian, not simply circadian. And so the thing that's optimizing the circadian is going to start disrupting your infradian rhythm and starting to negatively impact those six systems of the body, the brain, the, the microbiome, the metabolism, the immune system, the stress response system, the reproductive system, et cetera, right? And so that's really, the. if you remember nothing else from our talk today, you've got to remember that you are operating with both the circadian clock and the infradian clock, but everyone else, children, men, and elderly people are only operating with a circadian clock only. And so all of the information about intermittent fasting or, you know, hit workouts, that works really well for them mm -hmm. because they're circadian based and the research was done on circadian systems. But from your first bleed to your last, you have a circadian and an infradian clock, and you've got to learn how to support your infradian rhythm and not constantly work against it and wreak havoc on all these systems of your body. Wow. So how does one support this? So I didn't just paint a picture around the problem in the new book. I also then created a new solution, and that solution is called the cycle thinking method. Mm -hmm. And this method is... A a, it's something that men have been doing forever, actually, turns out, right? They organize their workouts, their meals, according to what optimizes their male circadian hormonal biological clock, right? They do, they wake up super early in the morning, they take advantage of all their testosterone, they do their heavy, intense training, they do their deep work. As the day goes on and on and their testosterone wanes and their estrogen is more dominant, they're more social until they reach a point where they're in the man cave and they have to reset, go to sleep, make the testosterone for the next day, rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat the same, same, same every single day at the same time. So whether they're looking from the vantage point of uh, what's the right workout to do each day, there is a specific answer if you have male hormonal chemistry. What's the most successful way to schedule your day? It's one pattern. They just have to repeat it over and over again. With female hormonal biochemistry, you have four patterns. And so you have to learn, they, and they repeat once a week, right? So you have one for one week, another, you have four over the whole month. One of each one is a week long. And you just change. The three pillars of the cycle thinking method are uh, your food, your fitness, and your uh, time management. And you, because again, this is what men are doing. They manage their food, their exercise, and their, their productivity according to their circadian patterns. I'm suggesting that you do it for your infradian. And the results are pretty amazing. You know, you're, you're really working with your system. You're decreasing stress. You're getting more done with less effort. You're taking advantage of the fact that, oh, by the way, did you know your brain chemistry changes and your brain shifts structurally by 25% over the course of the month, you can think and create and, and problem solve in unique ways each of these four phases um, and take advantage of that in your work life, in your career, in your relationships as a mom, it makes everything easier. And this, this is why I named the book In the Flow because I remember being somebody who was trying to, you know, try to, trying to create a competitive edge for myself. You know, I would listen to Tony Robbins and I would try these different power mornings and I would do whatever was out there. And what was so frustrating was that I would try it for a few days. I would push myself. It always felt like a force, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I would never be able to stick with it. And I always used to criticize myself about that, saying, gee, what is wrong with me? But the, but the, the thing that, that was so enticing was this idea that if you created this perfect routine for yourself that they were telling you was the same every day, that you would achieve this peak state of flow, Right where you were constantly in your optimal zone with your health, with your life. And so the book is called In the Flow because without a W, because this idea is that for women, um, being in the flow is really about being synchronized with this infradian cycle. And uh, there's a very specific way that we have to do it that's different than how men do it. And we should have the chance to do it in a way that works for us. Yes, I relate to that 
on so many levels because I remember like pushing myself. I used to be crazy. I would wake up at 5 a.m. And, and do all this stuff and edit these videos. And, you know, and I just got so burnt out after like a year or two of doing that. And I've listened to some of your uh, past interviews on podcasts and you mentioned you don't use an alarm clock. And I was like, oh my gosh, I... I love that because here's a very successful, highly productive person that's writing books and achieving so much on a high level, running business, and you don't even set an alarm clock. And I'm like, that's uh, really inspirational to me, you know, like it gave me a different POV because I think we get so caught up in this productivity culture. You know, I always see these memes and stuff that are telling us to wake up at 5 a.m., go to your nine to five, and then work on your startup like from five to, to midnight. And I'm like, is this healthy? <laughs> I don't know. What are your thoughts on productivity culture these days? I, I'm so glad I'm getting to talk about that. Yeah, actually, this morning I had to be somewhere at 9 a.m. And I was so excited to be there at 9 a.m. that I, I, even though I went to bed on time, I woke myself up at 6 a.m. Then I was like, oh, it's too early. Then I woke up at 7 and I was like, oh, let me just stay in bed for like 30 more minutes. I, mean, I kept waking. I kept being able to. Who, how did I know to wake up at 6 a.m.? I think there's a way that your body and your mind work together that we're just not even scratching the surface around when it comes to that sleep-wake cycle. But that, that aside, I think um, the productivity culture, again, is just a great example of this, um, you know, I don't think it's, I don't think that it's coming from this like negative place or it, maybe I'm just an optimist, but it's just another great example of this gender bias situation where the, those that are having the conversations around power mornings and productivity happen to be men mm -hmm. and they're using research that has, whether they're aware of it or not, is exclusively really done on men. And then they're speaking to a mixed gender audience, but not acknowledging that there isn't any research that has been done or that they haven't yet sought that out and that they're really speaking about a very specific biological mechanism for male biochemistry. Because it is true for men, waking up at 5 a.m. is essential for their success with their health and with their productivity. But it is extremely not true for women. And I'll tell you why. First of all, the female brain has more complex connectivity compared to the male brain. And therefore, every night requires 20 minutes precisely more of sleep versus men, right? So if you're, if you're in a heterosexual relationship and your partner, your male partner is waking up at 5 a.m., you better not wake up until 520. That being said, depending on where you are in your menstrual cycle, right, if you're in your follicular and ovulatory phases, because you have a lower resting cortisol rate and a slower metabolism, you can wake up a little bit earlier, right? And feel good and keep your blood sugar stable and feel you know, focused and, and clear headed and not anxious and depressed. In the second half of your cycle, post ovulation in the luteal and the menstrual phases, your metabolism has sped up and your levels of cortisol are higher at rest. So if you force yourself to wake up, right? And a lot of us who str struggle with PMS, symptoms, that's an indication that you're not making enough progesterone. So that also means that you're probably not eight, being able to sleep successfully during this phase. So if that's happening, if you have insomnia, PMS-related insomnia, you definitely don't want to add even more exacerbation to the situation by forcing yourself to wake up early. So in that second half, you want to wake up slightly later when you feel rested and you would not do an early morning workout and you can't do high intensity interval training post ovulation because that's going to turn on muscle wasting, turn on fat storage, doing that first thing in the morning on an empty stomach with a faster metabolism and higher resting levels of cortisol is going to disrupt your blood sugar, destabilize your insulin levels, cause you to store fat, disrupt your ability to think in a focused way and get work done during the day and put you in a terrible mood. So how is working against your biology even worth it mm -hmm. to be more productive? And to ha frankly, to have a conversation with a mixed gender audience that does not factor in their actual biochemistry and physiological differences 
is really problematic because then the, the, the gender that's not being included then tries these things and then hurts themselves and doesn't feel good. And, you know, maybe doing it one day doesn't create a lot of damage, but weeks of it, months of it. Now we're talking about destabilized thyroid, destabilized ovulation, PMS, and other things. It's a cascade. And this is why 50% of women struggle with hormonal imbalances, and it's less than 10% for men, because they're, the system is optimizing their hormonal me mechanisms, and it's destabilizing yours. And the productivity culture is just an, another example of that, but it's the same example in fitness, it's the same example in nutrition. Our infradian rhythm is being excluded. This is not a, an inclusive enough conversation in my opinion. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like I said, it took me so many years to even realize this was happening. It took reading your book. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I wanna talk about the fact that 50% of women have hormonal issues. I mean, that's just what they're reporting right now. It could be much, in my opinion, it's likely higher. I mean, it, it's almost every woman that reports PMS, right? Now, we've normalized the conversation around PMS to say that that's normal, but it is not. It's a sign of hormonal imbalance, too much estrogen, not enough progesterone production. About 10, 15 years ago, the NIH published a very important study called the BioCycle Study, which showed that unchecked PMS in your reproductive years increased the risk postmenopausally of all four diseases of inflammation, diabetes, heart disease, cancer, dementia. So this little cultural joke that we have about PMS is doing you no favors because instead you should look at your PMS like you would look at having an elevated temperature. You would say, uh-oh, having an elevated temperature, got to do X, Y, Z. You should say the same thing about PMS. Uh-oh, having you know, uh, mood swings, breast tenderness, bloating, uh, headaches. Uh-oh, I better do X, Y, Z to get that resolved within the next cycle or two so I know that I'm healthy. But we've been so conditioned to ignore the biofeedback of our bodies that we don't realize that that's the equivalent of having a fever. And that's not just my opinion. The American College of Obstetrics and Gynecologists has decreed in 2016 that your cycle, your period, is your fifth vital sign, like your temperature, like the things they take at the ER, right? Wow. So, so I'm telling you today, the next time you have a period symptom, the next time you're tracking, uh, hopefully in my app, myflowtracker.com, right? Um, if you have a symptom, you got to start to tell yourself, uh-oh, I got to take this seriously, as seriously as I would take having a symptom of a fever. Okay. So I wasn't even aware of the fact that you could totally cure all your symptoms of PMS. I thought for sure, like there, there's pain or irritability, like that's just a given, that's just what you're going to have to. And I would assume that's kind of how I think that most women think. They just, we assume we're always going to have it. Like there's a way to cure all of this? I mean, first of all, let's address the fact that the assumption piece is this is this uh, thing that we just have to put an end to. And that's, mm -hmm. again, why I've written these books to just give you the correct orientation to your body because the, the mythology that you've been uh, fed, not just you, but you know, centuries of women, this mythology that you're supposed to be in pain, that when you become a woman, you then have to live with decades of suffering around your womanness. Um, you know, it's uh, institutionalized in our culture as this thing that, we, that you're supposed to passively accept. But as I go in great detail in section one of the new book, the systems of your body are designed in a phenomenal way to be so magnificently efficient and productive and powerful. Nature did not design you in any weaker way, right? And in fact, if you think about the fact that it's your gender that is responsible for 3D printing the tiny human beings. It's only logical that nature would give you the more powerful immune system, the more efficient stress response system, the bigger regions of the brain that have to do with leadership and community building. I could go on and on, but you'll have to read the book. You know, this idea that um, whether or not you choose to make a child, you have this extraordinary system. 
And then that particular mythology that PMS is what you should expect mm -hmm. is unfounded. Let's just take cramps. If nature designed you to be in pain, right, you'd have more of of the hormones or more mechanisms that create uterine contraction, right? Where the uterus contracts, the muscles of the uterus contract, and that can, you'll feel that sensation. And depending on the intensity of the contraction, you'll register that as varying degrees of pain, right? So if we were designed to suffer, if the biblical stuff was, is really true, right? We're supposed to be in pain, then nature would give you more of the, in this case, it's prostaglandins, more prostaglandins that control uterine contraction versus the ones that control uterine relaxation. But it's the opposite. Nature has only given you one prostaglandin that controls uterine contraction, PGE number two. And it's given you prostaglandin one and three that, that control uterine relaxation. So you have twice as many prostaglandins relaxing your uterus, causing you to not have pain. And you only have one that, co that creates contraction because that's more efficient. Now, you then ask, Elisa, but then why are so many people having cramps? That's because you are eating the wrong fats that jack up the production of PGE2 and suppress the production of PGE1 and 3. And that's why you have cramps. Change what you're eating and within a cycle or two, you can be cramp free. This is something that thousands of women have experienced already. And so the idea is, that it's exciting to understand that you may have come by this honestly, that you've inadvertently disrupted your powerful, magical female ecosystem. That's both the bad news, but it's also the great news because once you have the correct information, it's very straightforward and simple, right? As long as you do it to, uh, to create that opportunity for your body the way that it is designed already to function and thrive optimally, right? Wow. Which is my definition of female biohacking. It's like, you don't need to add stuff. It's more about taking the things out that are disrupting it and letting it do what nature designed it to do, which is for you to feel fantastic all the time. Okay, this hit on so many things for me right now, everything you just said. And something I really did wanna to talk to you about was endocrine or flow disruptors. Um, that is one of my favorite parts about what you talk about because I had no idea because of you, I threw away all my toxic makeup, all my, uh, shampoos and my lotions and everything that had questionable look ingredients. Look at how great your makeup looks today. I will say also, <laughs> yes, I am head to toe, uh, organic makeup, organic hair care. You know, listen, 20 years ago, even 10 years ago, it was hard to get eat like one-to-one -one swap products. Mm -hmm. But now there is um, an equivalent to like the Sephora's of the world that like Credo and Filane and um, Cat Beauty. And I mean, even on Amazon, you can find so many different swaps that are extraordinary, you know? Yeah, no, there's so much out there. And I, when I was going through everything I owned and I consider myself like a pretty like conscious person, like I think I make good choices or at least I try to, I was shocked at how much I owned that had things that you wrote about in your book in it. And I was just like, no, I'm throwing away everything. And then I started thinking and I was like, whoa, I've been using these my whole life. My whole life, anytime you walk into a drugstore and, you know, I ran out of foundation today and whatever you pick up there probably has things that you should not be using in your body. What are the detriments to using things that have endocrine disruptors in them? Like, what does it do? Well, certainly it will raise the concentration of what are called xenoestrogenic substances in the body. So these synthetic chemicals mimic estrogen hormone in the body and they bind to your estrogen receptor sites on your cells and that stimulates your cells, which is not good especially if you have um, a concern about you know inheriting cancer or things of that from your family history um, but even if you don't have that in your family history these chemicals are powerful enough to have these types of negative effects just on their own in addition before you even get to the place of worrying about that level of toxic exposure they can disrupt your cycle I remember I was doing a corporate lunch uh, lecture in New York. And at the end, this girl came up to me and she said, I don't understand what's wrong with my cycle. It's been really problematic and so heavy. And I mean, she just, it was, 
the, descri the description was pretty graphic. And the first thing I said to her, because she was so young, she had literally just graduated college and started, this was her first job. And I said, I'm going to ask you a strange question, but I'd love for you to answer me, you know, just directly. I said, did you grow up next to or very near a golf course? And she said, oh yeah, we lived on a, a development and the golf course, I, I could see one of the holes from my wind, my, you know, my backyard. The amount of pesticide exposure that this girl had been exposed to, and I don't know if they were drinking well water, or I don't know what the water situation was in the town, but it had disrupted her period to such an extreme extent that, you know, I had to recommend that she go find a physician that she could work with who could test her for some, you know, any sort of pesticide levels and heavy metal toxicity so that she could begin to do some detoxification. It can be that extreme. Now, she was one extreme case. Most of us didn't grow up on a golf course, but you have been ex exposed to people using pesticides in the lawn, or if you're not eating organic food, those pesticides are in your food and then going in your body. And we all know now the big controversy around glyphosates and, and the, the toxic you know, situation and repercussions from that. You have to be mindful because the amount of chemicals that you're exposed to in a 30-day period surpasses the amount of chemical exposure that your grandparents or great-grandparents, depending on your age, were exposed to over the entire course of their lives. And this is measurable in pregnant women. In the when the, you know, the baby is born, they can measure a very direct amount of the whatever the maternal chemical load was from her makeup and her hair products and whatever she was doing with her dry cleaning, it's already in that baby in significant levels and concentrations and things that they've been measuring. So I think it's just really important. You know, we've all been overexposed. Um, we have to do our part. We can't, you know, control the entire environment, but what you, whatever you can do to make your home and your lifestyle a healthy sanctuary for yourself is definitely worth your time. I think I remember reading your book and being shocked when um, I think there's a, a bit of information where you said there was a study in the UK that said over the course of a, a woman's lifetime who wears makeup, they ingest like 30, is it 30 pounds? Of toxins? Am I remembering that correctly? You, you know, I'd have to look at the book. I wrote it so, a few years back, but it, it is a significant mm -hmm. amount. I mean, think about it. And lipsticks are some of the worst offenders. But yeah, the, any the powder, if you're using like loose powder, whatever you're inhaling, you've got to be mindful. I mean, there's so many great product lines. Um, I love RMS. Um, Ilia is another great one you know, you can really, well, people makes a great mascara, you know, you can make good swaps and is everything a hundred percent pure? Um, sometimes yes. Sometimes there might be one preservative that's not that bad, way better of a choice than using things that are just full of completely synthetic. Um, mm -hmm. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to be nuts about it, but you can, feel really good about the fact that you're reducing your overall load by making the best choices that you can make in a way that's economically sustainable for you. So if someone really wanted to get started and they were kind of overwhelmed by, you know, the amount of ingredients and they don't want to have zero makeup, what would you say are kind of like maybe like the top two or three ingredients to look for that you should probably just try to get rid of if you're trying to make this switch? I mean, you know, I think that the list in Woman Code is pretty comprehensive. Mm -hmm. I would say um, I would recommend that you look for, uh, and actually this is a resource I use anytime I'm on the fly buying a product. I go to, and I love this organization, so I'm so happy to, I, I feel like I've never been able to share it in a podcast before, so I'm so happy to be able to do this <laughs> now. Environmental Working Group, ewg.org. <laughs> they have an ingredient finder. So let's say you're at the, at a store and you're, you're, you're like, Hmm, what is this something that's safe? What, what, I don't know how to pronounce it. I don't know what it means. 
you can literally just type it into their little pro ingredient finder and it will tell you exactly how much you need to worry about it or not. Mm -hmm. It is brilliant and there it, they have absolutely every possible thing listed. So yeah. I would just say, instead of trying to remember specific ones to worry about, you know, um, I would just really lean into that particular tool. They have an app, in mm -hmm. fact, for your, to make your shopping more convenient. And you can do this not just with makeup products and skincare products and hair care products, but you can do this with food too. If you see a preservative or an ingredient that you're like, hmm, you know, what is that? I came across one the other day I had never seen before. Somebody sent me a sample of a protein powder and they had um, I think it was silicon dioxide or some, something that I hadn't seen before. And I looked it up and I just, I wasn't really happy about it after I looked it up. I said, you know, that's not something I'm going to try. Um, so, you know, you can make these real time decisions based on the information that you're reading about. And I think that that's so empowering to always be learning and always come at a place of curiosity as opposed to fear and avoidance. Mm -hmm. um, you know, nail polish, I think they've done a really good job of, you know, making it clear that things are formaldehyde and toluene free and you can have five free and 10 free. And so doing as much of that as possible is good. Um, I, yeah, I, I think, I think you can, talc is definitely one to stay away from in your face powders. Um, that is a known carcinogen um, for women. Um, definitely avoid that. Um, trying to think of a few others that are really, really gnarly. Um, let's start with, let's, 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 anything that's like a formaldehyde base or a benzo base, right? Where you have, that's coming from uh, essentially oil, right? It's a, it's a, a derivative of uh, oil, crude oil. You want to stay away from those types of things. So, you know, the more natural, the better, the more organic, mm -hmm. the better. Um, and it becomes a pretty easy to spot the differences because you can pronounce or identify the ingredients in the brands that have things that you want to be putting on your face or, or, you know, in your, in your hair, things of that nature. Right. I also learned that the EWG app has a barcode scanner. So people want to scan products, they can do that. And something that was helpful when I was trying to find some of my toxic products I already purchased. Sometimes when you already purchase a product, you don't have the ingredient list. But if you type it into that app, sometimes they have it. Some then they have information about whether this is, you know, how it ranks. They have a scale of 10. So I try to throw everything out that was um that wasn't at least a seven. I was just like, okay. And that was a good place for me to start personally. So yeah, I do highly great. recommend that. Yeah. That's great. And there's so many people on Instagram that have, that are fully focused on, you know, t giving you like product swaps. And I mean, I think Credo Beauty is a great resource because um, it's founded by the guy who founded mm -hmm. Sephora actually. And he really saw that the green beauty market was going to be the next big thing. And so he founded a competitor to Sephora called Credo, uh, C-R-E-D-O. And you can go there and they have a, to a widget that like you put in your product and they'll tell you what the equivalent swap is. I mean, it's, it's so easy to make these swaps with your beauty routine, mm -hmm. your home care routine, right? Where you're cleaning your house. Definitely look for products from really solid companies like Seventh Generation, um, e-cover. You want to be cleaning with very simple ingredients, not things that you can't pronounce that right. could be toxic to you. So yeah, and then of course choose organic foods to eat as much as possible because again, um, you've got to really think about that what's going in, what's going in your environment, what's going on your body. Um, all of it counts. All of it adds up. Can we talk about tampons? I had no idea that like the most commercial brands of tampons have like poison in them. Like what? Why? I know. <laughs> I, know. Um, I think, you know, it's been so wonderful. In fact, I think it was five years ago now, five or six years ago, maybe five, that we had this sort of movement of female founded companies really reimagining this space of menstrual hygiene products. And so you have great companies like Lola and Cora who have been dedicated and Sustain who have been dedicated to, um, you know, creating organic menstrual 
hygiene products from tampons to pads. Um, and I, I think that that is just such a necessary evolution uh, because obviously you don't want to put synthetics and polyesters and other chemicals and bleaching agents and the things that they use to make the non-cotton tampons look like cotton, you know, that's, it's, it's, you know, the, the vaginal tissue is highly absorptive. And so you just don't want to be mixing the two. Um, I actually think if you're ecologically minded, there's been no better time to like ditch the actual physical products for a menstrual cup, which is completely non-toxic and really convenient and then you just like clean it and reuse it every month it's so easy and you, you put it in in the morning you set it and forget it until you go home it'll hold really for the vast majority of women the entirety of your daily flow um it's pretty great i haven't tried it yet but i want to i'm slightly yeah, I mean, scared <laughs> Yeah, you should do, listen, you know, everybody feels that way. Yeah. Uh, but think, think back to the first time you tried a tampon, you felt the same way, right? You're like, oh, oh yeah, yeah. I, I remember I had, <laughs> here, I'll, here's my first tampon story. So um, we were, my two best friends in high school, because I got my period very, very late, as you may remember from my books. And uh, we, it was the first summer that I had gotten my period. So I was 16. We, they met at my house because we were going to go to the, the pool, the community pool in my neighborhood because it was a hot summer day. And I unexpectedly, because it was so irregular, got in my period. And I was like, oh, I don't know. I got, I, I got to go to the pool, but I got the period. And so they're like, we'll use a tampon. I said, well, I just don't know how to use it. You know, I'm happy to use it. I just don't know how to use it. So the girls, my two friends were standing outside the door. My best friend handed me her Clinique mirror that they used to give away with the Clinique trio, right? And she's like, okay, use, put this on the toilet seat. Look at yourself, stick, you know, to stick the tampon in the whole thing. It was really fun. I totally did not get it in appropriately. It hurt the whole afternoon. Um, but anyway, what I recommend is if you're going to try the cup the first day, be home. You know, don't make that a day where you're running out and doing errands or meeting people. Be home and experience it, figure it out, see if, you know, see, build your confidence with it uh, working for you and your flow. And then you'll be like, why didn't I do this sooner? As everybody does with the cup. Yeah, I can't wait to have my experiment. It's now really the pandemic is the perfect time to really I mean, that is a experiment. Good point. <laughs> so in your new book, In the Flow, you mentioned that you speak about eating disorders. Um, so can we talk a little bit about that? What, what does it cover in there? Well, I just wanted to give a little bit of, an, of a nod to the conversation. I am by no means an expert in eating disorders, and that is not something that we treat at Flow Living in any direct fashion. But what I, what I have observed in the years of working with women who have had a history of this is that the thing that we aren't talking about is the fact that at puberty, right, you go from having a single biological clock to a dual biological clock system. You go from being a child with only a circadian rhythm, and then you're not told that you're going to have the addition of this infradian rhythm activated at puberty. And when you're a child, you begin getting that indoctrination about the keys to success is, you know, wake up at the same time every day, brush your teeth at the same time every day, go to bed at the same time every day, do your homework at the same time, meals at the same time, same, 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 sameness is lauded and rewarded. And then you are completely left unaware, uneducated about, and, you know, blindsided by the fact that now you have this powerful biological rhythm that, that gets activated at puberty called the infradian rhythm that is all about changing, 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 right? So you go from feeling the same every day to feeling different weekly, but no one is telling you that that is normal. And so there must be some component around, I'd like some research to be done. It's a question, but it's, a, it's something that I keep, I have some observational experience with, with women who've had this struggle, is that they feel on some level, they got a, you know, in their young teenage mind, we're talking 12 and 13 year old girls, um, 
become confused or the, I, the concepts of, of sameness, uh, perfection and being accepted and loved get really, you know, melded together. And at the same time, then your body starts changing. So then you want to do anything and everything again, consciously or subconsciously to force yourself to be the same, to try to go back to a place where you felt like your body was rinse and repeat every day. And I, I really think that that's an unexplored root of the, of the sort of psychological basis for some of the reasons why a person might begin to use disordered eating as a way to deal with this changing nature of the body and to try to force it to be the same. Mm -hmm. And I do also think that if young girls were told about their infradian rhythm, at age, not their, it doesn't, you know, at different ages, you don't have to talk about your period, you don't have to talk about sex, just that we have a biological clock, right? We all are learning about the circadian rhythm as children. The sun rises in the morning and we wake up. The, you know, the sun goes down at night, we go to sleep. That's the circadian rhythm. That's the big, that's a child appropriate age and stage appropriate way to talk about their circadian rhythm. Why can we not have a conversation with girls at seven and at nine that says, yeah, you know, there's this one, there's this biological clock that operates in a day. And then there's another one when you become a woman that operates over a month. And instead of feeling the same every day, you're going to feel a uh, different, four different ways over the course of the month. And we don't have to tell them anything more, but we can just prepare them to know that it is normal and healthy and a part of their journey to feel different weekly. And that is a good thing to be supported and embraced. I think if we did that sooner and earlier without getting into the specifics of the menstruation cycle, if it's not age appropriate or sex ed in the way that it's traditionally been done. And by the way, does not, has not served women yet in educating them about their mm -hmm. bodies. I think we would see a massive trajectory shift. The young girls that got that appropriate information would totally intrinsically understand how to use their bodies as a tool to master their life, as opposed to what we have seen all this time, which is when we leave this education out of a young girl's uh, experience, she feels like she has to be at war with her body or constantly work on her body or just not be at peace with this magnificent physical gift that she's been given. Yeah, I remember learning about my period and I learned about it in a pamphlet in fifth grade in like they had one day where they separated the boys and the girls and I, it was like from Secret, that deodorant company. Oh yeah, sure. And it was like <laughs> sponsored by Secret and we got deodorant and like a pad or something and that was it. That was all we learned about our bodies and how they work and about I don't know, taking care of ourselves. Like I didn't know anything about hormones. I didn't know anything about eating. It's, it's so crazy how little that we actually know and how little that the educational system incorporates information like this that would be extremely helpful, I think, for young women. Like I know in my case, I would have loved it. Yeah, and it's not the same uh, when it comes to young boys. Young boys are given a lot more helpful information that really does make them feel like they can use their bodies as tools to master their lives. Um, you know, as I said earlier, men from the beginning understand that they have this circadian biological rhythm that they have to orient their health and their life around in order to achieve optimal health and to be as productive as possible, right? They know that from a young age, that doesn't get introduced to them, you know, episodically at puberty. It's continuously messaged to them early to bed, early to rise, makes a man happy, healthy, and wise, right? We're now talking about the circadian rhythm and male hormonal biochemistry and how to optimize it, how to biohack, right? That's a, that's a children's rhyme that you tell when you want your kid to go to bed back <laughs> in the 1900s, right? And that is, we don't have an equivalent for the female physiological reality. And so we just leave that whole half of the population to flounder. And it, it does have really uh, significant implications on a woman's journey of her health, 
um, of her career, of her relationships, and it can be completely avoided by introducing this information as young as five and six and seven. You know, I have a five and a half year old daughter. You better believe she knows how to look at her poop, right? <laughs> she gives me the poop report every time it happens, you know, because she has to, I, I, and what, what am I teaching her about? Is she hydrated enough? Does she have enough vegetables, right? So she'll come to me and she'll say, it looked like the letter C, which is what we want, or it looked like dinosaur eggs. And I'm like, what does it mean if it looks like that? She's like, I have to drink more water, right? So I'm teaching her to interpret her biofeedback in these little ways, age and stage appropriate, so that as she gets older, she knows how to take care of herself. You can't wait until there's a problem mm -hmm. and then hope that a person can handle the fire hose of education that they have to give themselves. Why don't we drip this education little by little over the course of a child's life, especially if you have one to parent, so that they are prepared to take care of themselves, which is the primary job of a parent, to teach your child how to care for his or herself when they leave the home base. Yes, I love that. I love that she's learning about poop. <laughs> For another sure. thing, another thing I didn't know about till I was an right. adult, really, <laughs> probably would have solved a lot of my problems. Um, I also read that it says one in your book, one out of every two women will develop a thyroid problem. It's not I, shocking. Oh my gosh, it's so shocking. I have one. Um, what I realized was when I found out that I had one and I started talking about it, I unlocked, I feel like I unlocked a whole world of like everyone I know that has- Half of the people you know have it. Yep. That are on medication for thyroid and I couldn't believe it. I was like, wait a second, how did I not know this? You know, like we talk about our periods so openly a lot, like with women, um, if you grow up in circles that are comfortable with that. Um, I grow, I don't know, I've talked about my sex life very openly. I never heard of anyone talking about their thyroid until I was experiencing it. And then I was like, oh yeah, I would talk to someone, they'd be like, oh yeah, I'm on that too. I'm on, you know, Armor or yeah. Levithyroxine. Or... Yeah. <laughs> I was like, what? I think it's important, you know, which is why I wrote this, this new book, um, to ask the question, why is that? When, yeah. when that statistic does not exist in male population. Why is that? <laughs> right? Why, why is that happening to women? Right? Because men have thyroids too. And men have hormones too. Why are ours breaking down at such an alarming rate? And the answer, of course, is that um, being exposed to estrogen, you know, endocrine disruptive chemicals that are xenoestrogenic, and the fact that we're disrupting our infradian rhythm to such a large extent. Like, and just to be clear, the famous Boston nurses study, right, that showed that if women nurses work the night shift, or even male nurses, anybody who was working that night shift and disrupting their circadian pattern that profoundly, right, they got sick in the short term, and they they then had, as they tracked these people over multiple gener multiple decades, they were at increased risk for developing those big diseases of inflammation, cancer, diabetes, heart disease, dementia. So if we already know that disrupting the circadian rhythm has profound effects on your physiological health in the short term and then definitely in the long term, it is only logical to note that it is likely also the case for your infradian rhythm if we're disrupting it by not taking care of it because we haven't been told about it. Everything that you're doing, like for example, if you eat the same amount of calories every day for the whole month, you're disrupting your infradian rhythm. So basically, if you do anything the same over the course of a whole month, you're probably if disrupting it. If you do the it. same, if you endeavor, if your standard in your mind is, let me make sure I, I commit and am disciplined and have the willpower to do that same hit workout every day when I exercise throughout the month, you're disrupting your infradian rhythm. You're going to destabilize your blood sugar levels. You're going to jack up your cortisol production. You're going to throw off ovulation. You're going to increase inflammation in the body. You might disrupt your immune response. You then, depending on what you're doing, let's say you add intermittent fasting to this, you're definitely going to affect your thyroid. You could shrink your ovaries. Any of these trendy diets or workouts that have been studied on men and postmenopausal women who do not have an active infradian clock, 
using those in a system where there is an active infradian clock disrupts it and it is has real significant consequences and one of those can be endocrine breakdown like with your thyroid endocrine breakdown right where you know one of the one of the parts of your endocrine system starts to malfunction right when your th your your thyroid is a part of your endocrine system so if your thyroid's performing suboptimally we have to look at why did that take place it usually takes place first out of mismanaged blood sugar that's chronic because you're dieting you're skipping meals you're living on coffee or caffeine um and then that starts to affect your adrenal response. Now we have elevated cortisol, and then the body is just performing so inefficiently, it's asking for more help to deal with all this metabolic stress. The thyroid becomes maybe overactive, maybe underactive. It's not a good situation, right? Yeah. We cannot, we, we have to start to just learn there is a way that your body functions, right? These are just the facts. Your body functions in certain ways and, and needs certain levels of support. And if you do the right support, if you put the right inputs into that system, the system works perfectly, beautifully. But if you put the wrong inputs in that are especially ones that have been researched to work in a completely different physiological reality, you're going to muck up the system. Wow. I feel like, I feel like you're the future. I feel like you're sent from the future <laughs> to educate us. <laughs> I promise I am not a time traveler as far as I'm aware. I'm like, well, that would be weird if I didn't know it. <laughs> Who knows? I mean, I don't know how time traveling works. Yeah, me neither. <laughs> um, oh my gosh. One other thing I want to, there's so many things I want to talk to you about, but I don't want to monopolize your time, but shapewear. Shapewear interrupts your lymphatic system. Yes. I why are you talking about this? So uh, bras, especially <laughs> underwire bras, um, they're, yes, you have this beautiful lymphatic system that runs just right under your skin and is, there's concentrations of lymph nodes like in your armpits, in your groin. Um, and think about where this shapewear is going, right? It's like, mm -hmm. Like squeezing your upper thighs, right where the where those lymph nodes can be concentrated, and then of course where you're wearing like tightly fitting bras that have the wires that are too small. And most of us wear the wrong size bra, evidently, although that's what Oprah said years ago, and I believe her. Um, you know, <laughs> so if you're wearing a bra that's too tight, um, then that's literally bypassing the lymphatic system's ability to flow properly in that area. So you can have congestion in the lymph nodes around the breast tissue, which is definitely not good, especially if you're being exposed to xenoestrogenic chemicals. You see, it all works in this compounding way, right? If you're, if you're spraying your hair with some sort of toxic hairspray and you've got the underwire bra on and your body is trying to detox during the day, one of the detoxification pathways is the lymphatic system, but it's being compressed and blocked because you're wearing shapewear or underwire bras that are too tight, you know, it, it, you can't detox as much and that's mm -hmm. one day is okay. But if you're doing this every day, then you're now decreasing your ability, your body's ability to detoxify on a daily basis. That has a cumulative, real, and measurable effect that you don't want to be on the receiving end of because you'll start to see it in breakouts first, and then you'll start to see it affect other parts of your health. Um, so yeah, let it flow, you know, for sure. So <laughs> you don't wear the don't wear the shapewear on a regular basis if you don't have to. Especially now, we're all working from home. Mm -hmm. Wear a maxi dress, you know, be comfortable. Um, and in general, wear things that make you feel comfortable because being comfortable makes you feel confident and feeling confident is really the source of your beauty. Yes. Oh, wow. We are just right in line with hot pizza ass life right now. Like that's yeah, so, for sure. that's for sure. so true. Um, yeah, I'm loving all of this. I'm just, I feel like one of the biggest takeaways I'm getting from this conversation is just be wary of like all Instagram culture, <laughs> like fads, bad diets, like fad productivity well, see, messaging. No, just, that's just, <laughs> I think it's important that we finally uh, just talk about the elephant in the room, which is that mm -hmm. anything that you've read so far, if it's not explicitly including your infradian rhythm, then you need to know it's absolutely leaving it out. And so therefore, those suggestions 
most likely don't apply to you in terms of you getting the results that you want. That's important. That's the most important takeaway from today. Um, start to become aware that everything that's being um, displayed is focused on this um, circadian only clock and without including that we need a more inclusive conversation in every possible way um, from gender to race to uh, you know everything that's going on um, and I think that this is a great opportunity for women to just really understand that the the systems that they have tried have not been oriented to, to help their bodies actually work better. Mm -hmm. That's so great. Um, this has been so educational and I want to thank you so much for honestly, for improving my life, for educating me. And now my listeners also get to have this experience and learn from you and they can learn from woman code and in the flow and they can have your app my flow tracker. And is there anything else that they need to know to get more information about you or what sure. you do? Sure. If you're having period problems that you want some support with, come to flowliving.com. That is the world's first um, hormonal health care platform for women. I'm really proud to have built that for us. Um, you can buy the book and then get a whole bunch of free downloads at intheflowbook.com so that you can get started on female specific biohacking before your book arrives at your doorstep. Like you said, myflowtracker.com. If you're like, oh my goodness, I need, tell me what to do to support my infradian rhythm, I'm ready. Go to cyclethinkingmembership.com and join us at Flow 28. You'll get recipes, grocery lists, meal plans, workout videos, absolutely everything you need for each phase of your cycle so that you do not have to learn as much about this as I have. I have done made it really goof proof. Um, and if you want to follow me on social at flow living and at alisa.bd. Awesome. I'm going to go and sign up for that. And I do I, I'm 1 million percent follow her on social media because I always get so much great information from you. So thank you so much, Alisa. Thanks and, for having me. <laughs> and, and thank you. It was lovely. <laughs>